Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm also a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me on the show today are Alf and Andreas uh, from the Macro Trading Floor. They also both have research platforms of their own, the links of which are um, mentioned in the podcast and are also in the description of the podcast. I would encourage you to check them out. Um, they invited me on their podcast, The Macro Trading Floor, um, a couple of months ago, and we had such a good time that I invited them to come on Cognitive Dissidents. Um, it, was, it was one of my favorite conversations of the last couple of months last year, and I thought this conversation was really excellent as well. Uh, these guys are both super busy and just uh, rolled out new products and have deliverables out the wazoo, so I really appreciate them taking an hour of their time to come and talk to us, and maybe we can get them back on in a couple months, or I'll go back on the, the Macro Trading Floor. Um, listeners, this is uh, recording on Tuesday, January the 10th. This will probably come out in about a week. Uh, I have a lot of travel coming up uh, between now and the end of January. So we're going to record a lot of episodes um, this week uh, and kind of slow release them over the course of the next couple of weeks. So I'll remind you that as we go. But this one, I think, will come out um, in the next couple of days, probably next Monday, and then we'll kind of go from there. Um, as always, if you have comments about the podcast or want to hear more about what we do at Cognitive Investments and how we use geopolitics to uh, build investment strategies for clients, hit me up. It's jacob at cognitive.investments. Um, cheers. See you out there. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Andreas Alf, it's, it's nice to host you guys. Thank you guys for hosting me a couple months ago, and I appreciate you guys making time to, to come on here. Yeah, Jacob, my pleasure. I mean, you are a brilliant guest, I think, at the macro trading floor. Uh, one of the episodes I enjoyed the most, although you were not a macro trader. Nevertheless, it was pleasant, so very happy to be here. Yeah, we had tremendous feedback. Uh, yeah. Listeners, I... I, I didn't have to pay them that much to say that. Uh, we can we can go offline to tell them how much I had to pay them. And no, and no, I'm, I'm not a macro trader, but like these days, like pe like I find that macro is where geopolitical insights are being used the most. Um, I think we'll be seeing a lot more of each other um, over the next couple of years. I, I guess like one of the first questions I wanted to throw to the two of you is, you know, I've been doing the sort of the geopolitics thing now for literally over a decade. And I say on this podcast all the time, 10 years ago, I couldn't get a drink with you guys, let alone get you on a podcast or talk to you or anything like that. And now everybody wants to talk about geopolitics. So my, my first question is really to both of you, which is, um, first of all, like, when did you start thinking about geopolitics and where did you kind of get your information before? And then do you think it's a passing fad? Like I saw Peter Zihan went on Joe Rogan this week and like I kind of stopped in my tracks. And part of me worries that like geopolitics just is, you know, we had the Russia-Ukraine war. We had the China COVID stuff. Like, is everybody just going to pay attention to this? And then I'm going to go back to my, my, you know, my little cubby hole and no one's going to pay attention? Or do you really think that like this is kind of here to stay from a macro perspective? I guess that's my first. It comes from a sense of insecurity, too, from, from a geopolitical analyst's sake. But I thought I'd start with that. Jacob, first of all, I'm surprised that you listened to Joe Rogan, but um, <laughs> oh, I, that, that, I, that's my the, first the, take on that. The, the most difficult part of being a political analyst is you have to listen to all of it, man. You can't, you, you have to do the crazies on all sides. You have to like read the mainstream stuff. Like I, I cannot not listen to everything that's out there. Yeah, but um, let, let me answer your question uh, with, a, with a bit of anecdotal evidence. I wrote an article 48 hours before Putin decided to invade Ukraine named the biggest bluff of a century, <laughs> uh, obviously referring to Putin's uh, exercises around the border. Um, and I guess three days later, I decided that I needed a geopolitical strategist in my team. <laughs> um, so I, I guess that was really an eye opener to me. Um, and s secondly, I had quite a few of the subsequent market developments wrong uh, since I also had a wrong analysis of the um, aftermath of, of that ag actual invasion. Um, to, to me, it felt like a classic so-called risk-off event immediately, uh, but it certainly developed into um, a supply crisis in a matter of months. And I, I really pl played that 
in the wrong way. Um, and uh, here I am six months later uh, with a geopolitical strategy team <laughs> as part of my research business as a consequence of how wrong I was. Well, Andreas, that's a lot of wrong in one sentence. You throw it yourself. Oh my God. Um, no, but uh, Jacob, to try and get my take on uh, on your question, uh, it has always been relevant, but I think now it is relevant in a different uh, sense. So in macro investing, what you try to do is you try to either capture trends that are um, in the making, but who, where investors have not fully appreciated yet the extent of the trend. That's what I call like the macro trending trades. Those are like, you know, they are there. People know there is a trend like the Chinese reopening now would be a good example. People knew China was reopening, but they hadn't positioned early enough or long enough to capture the trade. And now China is the best performing asset year to date, right? The second type of trade is where you capture mispriced tails. So where there is a tail event that, you know, it remains a tail event, it's a low probability scenario, but investors are mispricing that. And on the long term, you're able to price that better. Geopolitics before 2020, I think, um, was mostly about tail risks. So that's exactly what Andreas was saying before. Putin invades Russia, yes or no. That's def uh, Putin invades Ukraine, obviously, yes or no. That's clearly a tail risk. It's not something that's going to happen as a base case scenario. It's a tail risk. But pricing that correctly was the advantage of having a good geopolitical strategist on your team. I think geopolitics in 2025, 2030, it's going to be much more driving the macro trending trades. Like it's going to be much more at the epicenter of asset allocation rather than defining whether you have a good tail risk management strategy, which means there's going to be more events where geopolitical expertise is required. So I don't think it's a fad at all. Hmm. And well, so kind of going into that for, sort of for the next year then, um, like, well, let's forget about tail risks for a second. Maybe we can come back to tail risk. What, but what are the trends that you guys are, are most focused on that intersect kind of with geopolitics in that way in, in just the year ahead? Like that, that, that's the other difficult thing I feel like with geopolitics, like it's very easy for me to throw things on the dartboard and, and talk about the trends. It's It's been much harder and, and in some ways more intellectually challenging to sort of do the discipline of, all right, well, here's the timing and here's exactly how long you have and here's when you need to exit and here's when you need to get in. So let's maybe just restrict ourselves to 2023 and, and what are the big sort of trades or trends related to geopolitics that you, you guys are looking at in 2023? Well, I and my team, we're turning more upbeat on geopolitics for this year as a consequence of the conflict in Ukraine being a frozen conflict by now. I don't think we should expect news that are relevant um, from a macro perspective over the next six to nine months from the Ukraine-Russian conflict. And to me, that is a positive since it means that energy prices will be allowed to fade, food prices will be allowed to fade, um, since the standstill in the conflict is positive news relative to the amount of fear that was being built up throughout the course of the summer of 22. Uh, and I think we see it already now, um, uh, clear trends towards lower prices in energy in Europe, clear trend towards lower prices of food in Europe. Uh, and to me, that is a game changer for the interest rate outlook. Uh, and I think we need to get used to large fluctuations in interest rates as a consequence of geopolitics. So 2022 uh, was a year of rising interest rates due to geopolitics. 2023 could be a year of falling interest rates due to fading geopolitical risks. Uh, but I certainly think that geopolitical risks could resurface um, both from, um, from Asia, but also from the Eastern parts of Europe. Uh, but for 2023, I think it's a macro trend to fade geopolitical risks. So it's certainly something on my radar. Um, and it's also something that I th find tradable. No, no. So it's a difficult, uh, you know, getting on what Andreas was referring to. So of course, there are a couple of events on the radar, right? Uh, short term. So the first is what's Putin going to do? Um, I mean, the guy basically doesn't have a major victory to claim at home or something that he could bring home as a victory uh, to basically stop the war. I don't think he has it yet, um, or at least an acceptable one for Russian people. So what what is he going to do there? 
Um, that's the first thing on the radar. The second thing, it's a bit more medium term, but it's interesting, is that basically the US is trying to cut away China from the semiconductor uh, chip business, right? Or they're trying to basically obstruct them as much as they can. Uh, that's another interesting one. It's not immediately tradable, but something definitely to have on the radar. And the other is, um, as well, medium term, there has been a trend of late, definitely, of uh, several central banks deciding to allocate more into gold than they are allocating into treasuries. So it's it's a rebalancing of their portfolio. Uh, they have, obviously, these are elephantic institutions. They take a long time to process what they're going to do. And here, probably, given the weaponization of dollar reserves in Russia, they probably decided to um, over-allocate to gold in their reserves. So that's something, as well, that takes ages as a trend to develop, but it's definitely something to pay attention to, I think, for the medium term. The um, the other thing, I mean, those then there are a bunch of tail risks left. Uh, Jacob has discussed in the past, like Taiwan, China, etc. But those remain tail risks, while the rest, in my opinion, are more like macro trending themes, either short term or medium term. Those are on my radar. Let me add to that, Elf. Um, as soon as the West seized the foreign exchange reserves of Russia, I suppose that the People's Bank of China at least held a meeting, <laughs> uh, right? Um, be, uh, simply due to the fact that the risk of getting reserves seized increased overnight. Uh, and it is visible from the data now that China is buying gold mm -hmm. uh, instead of treasuries, at least on a trend basis. Uh, and I think that's something to watch also when it comes to macro trends. Uh, I've been a long-term fan of holding gold um, to a certain extent in my portfolio, and I certainly haven't um, decided otherwise um, over the past couple of months. I've rather increased my conviction in having gold as part of my long-term portfolio as a consequence of what happened to the Russian FX reserves. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. But it seems to me that the kind of, well, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't looked at, at the, the gold data recently. Are, are there countries that are doing that, that are turning more to gold, mm. the ones that are on the wrong side of the United States and everybody else just doing things as business as usual? Or is this sort of a global trend in central banks that you're seeing? Everybody's going to start allocating to gold because, you know, how, how like the dollar's not going anywhere, obviously, as you said, Alf. It takes like light years for these things to actually take place. But mm. is, that, is that starting to wobble? Like, or, or is everybody going to start allocating? allocating to gold or is it just like you know russia and turkey and china and maybe a little bit of india well if we look at the most recent data it was a record quarter uh, in terms of central bank buying of gold in q4 last week last year uh, if we look beneath the surface i guess you're right jacob that we can pinpoint the regions buying um so are you on team russia slash team china or are you on team US, um, the countries on Team Russia slash China, they are buying. Um, it's less of a trend elsewhere. Yeah, pretty much. And also, I mean, the dollar is still the denominator of about 80% of trade invoicing and commodities are denominated in dollars globally and the dollar facilitates global trades. So, it, I mean, you can talk about this, these trends, and as you said, it takes light years before it really starts to make an impact on the dollar dominance. Nevertheless, I think it's an important trend, and it's mostly coming from uh, countries that are, you know, a bit trying to obstruct the US. It's not a global trend. Yeah, well, one of the things that I, I always look at when it comes to this is, like, if, if you look at, like, um, like, yuan usage internationally, I think the yuan is somewhere on par with the Canadian dollar right now in terms wow. of, like, you know, makeup of global reserves. And if we're going to be afraid of China, I guess we should also be afraid of Canada taking over the world. But <laughs> but to your point about, like, you know, using the dollar for trade settlement and things like this, this is one of the things that makes me a little more optimistic about the European Union, because the real competitor to the dollar is the euro. And there are parts of, let's say, like West Africa, where European nations have done a good job of muscling out the dollar, where the euro has actually become the top denominator of, of trade and investment and some some of these other things. And when you look at, I mean, it, it goes to your point about this U.S.-China sort of trade war, and I'm sure we'll dive into that a little bit in the conversation later. Um, but there's also like this U.S.-EU like mini trade war seems to be back in the ether too. Because if you look at Biden's industrial policy not exactly friendly to the Europeans. The French are angry. I mean, I guess the French are always angry, but they yeah. seem even angrier than usual. <laughs> the Germans are, are angry. So I, I wonder if you also see if it's not just that, you know, Team US, Team China thing. It, it also feels like Team EU might be waking up to the fact that, hey, like 
the U.S. is two years away from maybe reelecting Trump or reelecting somebody that doesn't like us. And even this government that's supposed to be friendly towards us is like trying to cut us right out un from, from underneath us. I wonder if you guys feel that too. But Jacob, now that you have a Dane and, a, and an Italian uh, on the podcast, we can at least agree on hating on the Frenchman, right? Uh, yes, so, so all, all good on that. Um, but joking aside, um, I think you're onto something when it comes to um, the global relevance of the euro because i think a lot of positives actually happened through the pandemic um for the euro uh, counterintuitively the fact that the european union agreed on a bigger bond issuance program of common debt is a long-term positive for the euro if you ask me because one of the things that um is on top of the list for every fx reserve manager um, in central bank institutions across the globe is that they want a big liquid underlying bond market to invest in with the currency that they hold. Uh, so if we assume that over time, uh, the Eurozone actually issues more common denominated debt, I consider that a positive for the Euro since it increases the possibility of other central banks buying the Euro and investing in these uh, liquid bond markets on the line. And as of now, there is no competitor competitor to the US Treasury market. But I guess over time, the European Union could build a competitor by issuing more common debt. So uh, Jacob, basically, when it comes to the Euro, I think the, um, the main reason why the Euro couldn't really compete with the dollar as a reserve currency is self-inflicted pain by Eurozone policymakers from two perspectives. The first is um, you need to export your currency abroad. And how you do that is uh, with current account deficits and with fiscal deficits. That's how you normally, with twin deficits, make sure that you can export your dollars abroad or your euros abroad and you keep the supply well alive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, the austerity dominating in the Eurozone for decades and that mentality had made that impossible because, yes, you can do current account surpluses, but ultimately uh, it was all a saving thingy for Germans. And um, when it comes to fiscal deficits, forget about it. That's not allowed. Uh, you, you can't do that, right? So that, that limited by, uh, by definition the size and, and, the, and the liquidity, let's say, of the AAA rated um, high-quality liquid Eurozone government bond market. That's the first self-inflicted problem. And the second is that you need a fiscal union as well to be able to then deliver uh, decent fiscal deficits and the supply of euros necessary to the rest of the world to be the, far, the, the reserve currency of the world. And I mean, again, the Eurozone fiscal uh, program, the SURE program or the EU program are a first step towards that direction. Um, it doesn't make me particularly excited about the possibility that um, this is going to be done on a large scale. Uh, I mean, of course, it's been done once. So as Andrea says, it's a good precedent. It's better than never doing it in the first place. But if, I mean, I live it, most some of my time in the Netherlands and I'm Italian. I, I can tell you that this cohesion necessary to create a fiscal union, a banking union and all that entails, it's just not there. It's not there. So the European uh, joint fiscal program was a crisis reaction. Europe is very good at it. You throw everybody in a room and you say, hey, uh, we're going to implode if we don't do something. And we had that in 2011, in 2012. We had then, uh, that with the pandemic where BTP boom spreads, the spread between Italy and Germany went to 400 basis points over a few trading sessions. And when there is a crisis, ultimately Europe has this survival bias to survive. We find a solution. Uh, does this mean that Germans, Dutch people, etc., all of a sudden love the idea of a fiscal union and a banking union with Italians, Greeks, and Spanish people? I don't think that, to be honest. Well, I, f I feel like the Italians and the Spaniards should go back and say, well, we don't want to be in an energy union with countries that bet so much of their uh, industrial policy on cheap energy from Russia, right? I, f I feel that's, like you guys have a leg to stand on. Well, that's a fair point, but my buddy Andreas has done some work showing the... Um, exposure that each of the single country had to natural gas and the reliance uh, and i think italy wasn't doing particularly well either yes but uh, let me just quote a uh, one of your fellow italians alfonso um the former head of the commission romano prodi um okay. he he said 
uh, after the introduction of the euro, I'm sure the euro will oblige us to introduce a new set of economic policy instruments. It is politically impossible to propose that now, but someday there will be a crisis and new instruments will be created. And I think the pandemic was uh, basically an example of that. Um, yeah. The euro will slowly but surely transform into what politicians want it to be. They just need a crisis to um, act as the excuse to implement it. Yeah. Yeah, but if if they did if they can't if they can't use the crisis that they and really two crises if they can't use the combination of COVID and the Russian invasion of Ukraine to get all the way there, like it's very hard for me to imagine. Well, it's not that's not true. Have you guys been watching the show on Netflix called Earth Storms? I don't even know if you guys have it in Europe. It's like each episode is about like one's about volcanoes, one's about earthquakes, one's about. To, I'm convinced we're all going to die. Like I'm seeing tail risks literally <laughs> everywhere right now. Like Europe could split in half due to an earthquake. And anyway, we, we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But it it does. Like for me, this is sort of a make or break year for the European Union. Either it pushes forward on some of these things, like it needs to, you know, it needs to show some progress on expansion with North Macedonia. It needs to not take the Italians to task for fiscal deficit spending. They need to figure out what they're doing with Hungary, either kick them out and punish them for real or like bring them into the fold. Like I feel like if we're still squabbling on the same level in Europe at the end of the year that we are today, I'm going to start thinking my own bullishness on, on Europe is misplaced. But the funny thing, Jacob, is that the European Union only have rules on how to join, but they haven't agreed on a set of rules on how to kick a country out again. Because um, I think when <laughs> countries gather to agree on the rules, they couldn't even imagine scenario a scenario where someone wanted to leave again, right? Uh, we obviously have a country leaving now, but um, anyway. Yeah. Andreas, can I make a, can I tell a nice story on this, not even thinking about the possibility of a country leaving? So when I was in my previous job um, at ING, it's, it's a global bank headquartered in the Netherlands, so a Northern European bank. Uh, at some point during stress periods, there was always this thing like, oh, we need to hedge our Italian risk. You know, Italy is going to leave the country. It's going to blow up or whatever it is. It's always the same story, right? Okay. So at some point, we were looking into credit default swaps uh, to hedge some Italian risk. Okay. That's a typical um, way to do that. And uh, so they, they tasked me. It's like, oh, okay, we need to buy some CDS in Italy. I'm like, guys, come on. It's, you know, every time we have an event, a referendum, a, an election, you know, the, the risk premium go up and that's exactly when you want to hedge. But okay, leave that aside. How do we do this? Okay, so I look into the CDS contracts and back then I learned there are two. I'm like, what the hell is this? So there is a CDS contract, look, look at this, that was actually um, done in 2003, so a bit after the European Union was formed. And that CDS contract protects you against the risk of a European country defaulting. Defaulting means that um, effectively they do not pay back on that, but if they choose to redenominate their debt from Euro to Italian Lira all of a sudden, then that does not trigger a default event under the CDS contract. Why? Nobody ever freaking thought that a country would exit the Eurozone and redenominate their, their debt in their domestic currency. It was just not foreseeable. So in, um, after the, the crisis of 2011, 2012, when that became a serious possibility with Greek and Italy, etc., a new contract was actually formed. I think it's 2014 version, where if Italy would decide all of a sudden not to outright default on their debt, but just to swap their currency of denomination where, where the, the law allows, you would still be protected. And that would be considered a default event in any case. So there are two contracts. And of course, the second one trades more expensive than the first one to hedge because it protects you against another risk, which is the redenomination risk. But it goes to show, as Andreas says, that in 2003, until 2012, actually, one might argue, there was not even uh, the remote possibility foreseen that a country would leave the Eurozone, would re redenominate their domestic debt, not at all. Otherwise, I need to call my bank to redenominate my mortgage into Lyris. So <laughs> if that's a possibility. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, might, I might want to get on that too. Uh, yeah. I mean, here here in the United States, we had a similar thing in the 1800s where we didn't imagine anybody was going to leave the Union and we fought quite a bloody conflict over what it meant to leave. So I hope you take some lessons from, from us and, and yeah, don't hopefully. do the same thing. In in the vein of mistakes, uh, there I'm, there's a report circulating out there. One of the, One of my first sort of I did a lot of politics and a lot of Middle Eastern politics at the beginning part of my career. But as I started to branch out, I, I got assigned 
um, a study of the Italian banking sector, I think it was in 2015, uh, and non-performing loans there. And there is a excellently written piece out there from me that says the the imminent collapse of the Italian banking system that you can read and laugh at me if you want. Um, but I, I thought I'd get both of your takes on this because I, I had a Polish expert um, on the podcast a couple months ago, and it was a great episode. Um, but one of the things that shocked me was how... Um, how angry he was at Germany, how he felt like, and this is somebody who generally has supported the European Union in general and has supported more integration, um, but he was fed up with the Germans and felt like the Germans were sort of out to get Poland and weren't going to help the rest of the European Union from an economic perspective. And he thought it was probably impossible to do this, but he wanted Poland to think about you know, becoming its own economic block and center of gravity in Eastern Europe. So I wanted to ask you guys, both as a Dane and as an Italian, like, First of all, like, does the euro stop with the Germans? And do you have any faith that things have changed in Germany? Or do you think that if you really got to a crisis point that, you know, Scholz would be uh, parroting the same kind of austerity bullshit that the Germans, you know, paraded around in 2014 and 2015 to the Greeks? Well, first of all, let's let's have a look at how much each and every administration in the European Union has set aside to cover the energy bill, um, at least on... 2022 prices, the German administration had set aside the most um, for this energy bill. Uh, I think it was anticipated to be around seven and a half percent of GDP at the prices of uh, of Q4 2022. Prices are obviously lower now, so the backstop that they've promised on energy prices is cheaper. Uh, but I think that was a material game changer. Um, from a fiscal policy perspective in Germany. Uh, it was the first time in my adulthood that we saw the Germans um, basically open the floodgates to fiscal spending. Um, and assuming that they will end up with quite a deficit this year, uh, we obviously don't know, given that we don't know the path of future electricity and natural gas prices. Mm -hmm. I would argue that they lose a lot of credibility in the fight against deficits, um, given that it is not per se a crisis year in Spain, given that they have lower energy prices. It is not per se a crisis year elsewhere in Southern Europe. So it's kind of upside down when it comes to uh, fiscal spending relative to what we've seen over the past decade otherwise. <laughs> Am I allowed to swear? Fuck yes, do whatever you I want. I mean, you are asking him, tell me what does he think of German? I mean, you need to be prepared for this. No, Go just kidding. It. Just kidding. But this is valid for um, most of the developed market economies. And it's Keynesian bullshit. <laughs> so that's the answer to the question. <clears throat> Fiscal deficits are nothing else than the government blowing a hole in their balance sheet and transferring the same amount of net worth to the private sector. So I'm not sure why people still think that in order for governments to run deficits, then there must be somebody to fund them. Because if you run the accounting of it, really, that's not how it works. When the government blows a hole in their balance sheet, they're literally issuing net worth to the private sector without a liability for the private sector attached to it. Now, the European um, countries do the opposite. They, at least the Northern European bloc, tends to think in the opposite way, which is, you know, we need to keep that very low. And what this has done, Jacob, is it has generated a gigantic amount of private debt creation in Northern European countries. So come mm -hmm. have a look at Germany, the Netherlands, um, Austria, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, come have a look at that. You'll see private debt to GDP ratios, summing up households and corporates, which are incredibly high. The Germans are a bit smarter because they use an accounting trick and it's called contingent liabilities. So KFW is a um, German sponsored, basically 100% owned or guaranteed um, a development bank that effectively issues loans and has an, a huge gigantic balance sheet to do lending, which means to provide leverage to the private sector. Well, all the KFW leverage is not accounted into that ratios by the Eurostat, and it's not even resulting in private debt to GDP. But if you sum private debt, public debt, and contingent liabilities of all the European countries, you'll see who's leading the table is not Italy, and it's not Greece, but it's Germany, the Netherlands, and these bodies. They're only transferring the, the liabilities to the private sector. Because at the end of the day, if you need to create money, either the government creates it for you, or you borrow up yourself. 
So in the <laughs> Netherlands, for instance, you have gigantic household debt when it comes to mortgages, right? They have transferred the burden of levering up to the private sector. <laughs> so it's Keynesian bullshit. Basically, you don't do it from the government side, you push the private sector to do it. But now, <laughs> go ahead, Andres. My rant is, is over for a second. Okay, Andres, tell me. <laughs> I just wanted to provide a bit of anecdotal evidence from uh, one of the most indebted countries uh, worldwide when it comes to private debt, namely Denmark. Um, I guess the reason why we allow ourselves so much private debt is that we have some of the biggest pensions world, right? So we obviously need some kind of asset to match the liability. Mm -hmm. But for me, as a um, representative of the millennial generation, um, I hate to say that what we end up doing is that we lever ourselves to the tits in our houses um, with an asset that we receive in, I don't know, 45 years from now or so. Uh, and I hate that mix. Um, I would much rather prefer to have the assets uh, cl closer to now, if you know yeah. what I mean. And, and by the way, the assets are your pension and the market value of these assets is basically the bonds and the stocks and the real estate that the pension funds buys for you, which requires further and further leverage <clears> for <throat> these asset prices to go up. So all you're doing is basically levering up the private sector and then saying, hey, I have private assets, which are my pension funds that depend on this leverage in the first place. So at the first deleveraging episode, you get hit on the mortgages and the house prices. Your pension fund gets hit at the same time on the house prices and on the stock market. It's not a great model, but we, Northern European countries go that way because they hate public debt. So instead of doing government money creation, they do private sector leverage. Now, um, so to answer Jacob's uh, question, do I think Germany is going to change when it comes to public debt? Uh, it's a crisis reaction function. I think Andreas is right. They have done a gigantic uh, guarantee program when it comes to energy bills. They're going to use less than that. They've been lucky so far. Um, but it shows that it's not a taboo as it used to be. So it's not as bad as it used to be. Black zero, we can't do this at all, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In emergency um, time, they will step up. Does it mean they will continuously create uh, fiscal deficits as, as an ongoing thing? No, I don't think so. That's too much rooted in their DNA. Mm. Uh, but it, it still it still depends going forward on whether they change course in the energy policy in Germany. I see positive winds blowing across the European continent in the energy policy, except for in Germany. Uh, they still have children books authors behind the wheel when it comes to their <laughs> energy policy, if you ask me. Um, so nuclear is dangerous and stuff like that, which to me is kind of an exaggeration by now. Um, but in any case, this is still an example that they are willing to pay the bill of the energy policy that they pursue, uh, which to me is a game changer for the overall fiscal outlook in the Eurozone. Uh, and you were asking about Poland. I don't know why we've, we spent 45 minutes talking about Germany when you asked the question about Poland initially. Uh, I'm, I'm leaning uh, in the direction of Eastern European outperformance this year. Uh, first of all, as a consequence of Eastern European countries being well positioned to take part in the rebuilding of Ukraine, if a frozen conflict allows. So I think it will to a certain extent. Uh, Poland is a great example of such. I think you've mentioned that um, a couple of times as well, Jake, over the course of the past couple of quarters. I have, uh, but I, I, I'll just say I, I don't see a frozen conflict. I see a, I see a Ukrainian victory. My, my uh, scenario wow. doesn't imagine that Poland or anybody else gets those gains if we're in frozen conflict land. That would be bad, I think, for that thesis, from my perspective. Hmm. So, so how, how will they win and when? <laughs> Let me ask you that. Uh, well, that's a, well, just a really easy question halfway through the podcast. I get to take up. Um, well, look, I, I got taken to task on Twitter for this too. Just because the Ukrainians are winning today does not mean they're going to win. Um, in some ways it's a cliche to say that this is the most critical part of the war because every part of the war is the most critical part of the war until it's over. Um, but we have sort of reached a lull in the fighting. Um, the ground is either frozen or muddy, so it's really hard to move tanks and armored personnel carriers and all these other things from thing to thing. So I think what you see right now um, is the Russians are gearing up probably for a spring offensive and the Ukrainians are gearing up for a spring offensive of their own. Um, 
victory for the Ukrainians means pushing the Russians back, um, or it means the Russians collapsing in on themselves. Um, so I think I think those are your two scenarios. I would put more more money on the Russians collapsing in on themselves than I would the Ukrainians being able to push them all the way back. It's also hard for me to figure out exactly what Ukraine wants to do. Like Zelensky says he wants Crimea and he wants to go back to, you know, 2014 borders and the whole thing. I think some of that is signaling to the Europeans and to the Americans. It's to say, hey, we need you to keep giving us weapons. We need funding. We need all these other things. Um, but if he really means that, if he means what he says, then like we're headed up for a pretty intense clash um, in eastern Ukraine kind of going forward. So I, I danced around your question a little bit. But what victory looks like, it's either the Russians collapse or the Ukrainians can push them back. And, you know, the Russians... They generally suck at warfare. The one thing, the reason Russia's been around for as long as it has is they have more stamina than anybody else. They'll outlast you and take more punishment and more suffering as a population than just about anybody else. Um, and I, I mean, that's all that I can see Putin really playing for at this moment. So let me add one thing to that um, discussion and the global ramifications for macro trends. Um, My geopolitical team has been very vocal in recent weeks that they don't find the Chinese reopening to be as positive for global energy prices as generally thought. The reason being that China is now, if not the only, then one out of two clients of Russia. Uh, so it is simply not a feasible scenario that Russia will back any supply cuts in OPEC as a consequence Uh, of the Chinese reopening. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese will ask Russia to keep production intact to ensure that supply meets demand. Uh, and China holds a lot of leverage in that question right now, given that Russia has nowhere else to sell the oil barrels. Yes. I mean, as, as I've said before, I mean, Putin transformed Russia from a from a great power into China's gas station. But I, <laughs> I, I, think, I think this is a good way of actually backing into... Uh, One of the other questions I wanted to ask you guys was sort of U.S. versus international. But I think China is a good place to sort of begin that conversation. And to your point, Andreas, I mean, that's one of the things I'm thinking about all the time right now. What does China's reopening mean for energy prices? Mm. And honestly, I've been thinking about it for a month. I'm still not sure. I'm sort of sitting on the sidelines right now and reading what I can. And I don't feel comfortable sort of making a call either direction. I will say in the last week, this Chinese move to suddenly make nice with Australia and start re-importing Australian coal again, I think that's a big deal. I think people are, are sort of downplaying how big of a deal that is. And it's a big deal from a diplomatic perspective because, and this we've, we've already seen indications of, like China softening, um, I think they know that they took it on the teeth. They're trying to slow down this US machine that wants to isolate them from all these supply chains. They, they're you know, they're um, moving the wolf warriors to different parts of the foreign ministry and trying to get, you know, trying to be nicer sort of in general. But the fact that they're importing coal from Australia again, they're willing to do that about face with a country that they really tried to make an example of the last two years with Australia tells me, um, you know, energy security is more important maybe than looking good at that sort of top diplomatic level because they must be, I imagine that they're scared if, if they're going to, to import from Australia because that's, I don't know, that, that's a significant come down for them. Yeah, the um, Chinese reopening is a very interesting topic for energy and commodities. If you look at uh, the market reaction so far, it's been interesting to say the least. I mean, anything that is generally well correlated to China and to a strong cyclical growth push that comes from something this big, like reopening the second largest economy in the world, plus spent up stimulus, which is sitting on the consumer's balance sheet and can be now spent finally mm -hmm. by Chinese consumers. If you look at everything around, Um, you know, Germany is one of the largest trade partners for China. And so the DAX is doing very well. The German stock in this indexes are, are doing well. If you look at Australian dollar, a, a currency well related to China is doing well. Korea is doing well. You see it priced a little bit around uh, um, uh, different asset classes, not in commodities to the same extent. Yeah. So you see that crude oil is giving a damn about uh, uh, the China reopening, like nothing literally is happening in crude oil. <laughs> Some other commodities, which normally uh, trade well with China, like copper, but also other base metals, steel, uh, aluminum, iron ore, that kind of stuff. Um, it's actually doing okay, but not overperforming with the normal strength you would expect on a Chinese reopening. 
So that makes me think a couple of things. Well, first of all, China is, of course, front-loaded by purchasing some of these commodities beforehand, right? So they have prepared for the reopening. I mean, they knew uh, a couple of weeks in advance. Uh, insider information from the Chinese Communist Party, you would expect, right? That they would have reopened. Uh, and the second thing is, um, well, I mean, there are like push and pull forces. There is a pull force, which is the global economy slowing down. I mean, the, the forecast consumption of oil if the labor market in the U.S. tanks and if Europe walks into a recession has to be, from a demand side, lower than what it would have been in a, in a strong growth year for the global economy. So you have this pull force of nominal growth slowing down, but then you have these push forces like, you know, China reopening. Ooh, that's a strong push to nominal growth from a country that generates a lot of aggregate demand for commodities. So you, you'll have to be able to navigate these two different forces in 2023. And at the moment, I think the Chinese reopening has been pretty decently priced in Chinese equities, in Korea, in Australia, in Europe, in everything cyclical related to China, not in commodities. And I think some of these base metals where, uh, Jacob, the supply is less easy to manipulate. So with oil, you have SPR, you, are, you can front load, but when it comes really to physical need for steel, for aluminum, for that kind of stuff, then I think that it's a bit more complicated to constrain this, this commodities. Copper is another example of that, which I think should actually react a bit stronger to the Chinese reopening that it has done so far. Well, I'll, 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 take, I'll take you up on the invitation to go down that rabbit hole because um, we, we, we think copper looks a little divergent relative to the other industrial metals here in the last year or two. And I've been spending a lot of the last five days reading everything I can get my hands on in terms of copper. And my working thesis there is that it's the China reopening plus the fact that copper is so critical for electric vehicles and next generation clean technologies and stuff like that. So we might actually be at the tipping point where copper can be that first industrial metal that progresses from dependence on the Chinese construction boom to, hey, if you get some Chinese demand, that's great. But then there's also all this other demand from China and everywhere else for building electric vehicles and offshore yeah. wind and all, all that other stuff. It might be too early, but I, I, that's kind of what I'm circling around. Do you guys have feelings there one way or another? Well, um, I've done quite a few studies on historical correlations between the Chinese economy and various parts of the commodity market. I release a substack called the Energy Cable every Monday um, with um, question marks around <laughs> what's going on with this Chinese reopening and what the ramifications are for the global economy. But what I will say is the following. If you look at history, uh, it is relatively clear from the data that a Chinese rebound is positive base metals relative to energy. And why is that? Uh, first of all, because we see a pattern historically um, of unleashed reserves uh, from the strategic petroleum reserve in China every time there is a rebound in economic activity. If we look at the inventories uh, of energy relative to base metals in China heading into this reopening, um, during Q4, we saw a material rise in the amount of gasoline at inventory in China relative to the rise that we saw in copper. Um, so I clearly lead that way still that this is a positive event for base metals relative to energy, just as a consequence of the inventory level setting into this reopening and based on historical studies on what happens price-wise after a Chinese rebound. So. Uh, this is kind of my five cents right now. And I've also noticed that China increased the quotas um, mm -hmm. for exports of refined products. I find that a crystal clear signal that they have plenty of gasoline at inventory. Mm -hmm. Anything to add there, Alfred? You want to move on? No? Okay. When Andreas talks about commodities and energy, I just do this. No, just do I, that. Uh, it's not my... Uh, expertise area. I try to do all global macro things, but I, I do broadly agree with Andreas. Yeah. Well, Andreas, I, I, I need to have you back then and we need to have a whole hour long conversation about renewable diesel and soybean prices and whether I should go long soybeans right now because I've got two little angels. I got an angel and a devil on my shoulder and I'm not sure which one to listen to. But um, I know you guys are both busy. I want to get us out of here on sort of this last question, which is from a geopolitical perspective, I've been talking now for a couple of years about the emergence of a multipolar world. It's what we talked about on your guys' podcast um, in general. Uh, but I'm in the weird place of for 2023, when I was making my 2023 forecast, um, 
the, the world doesn't look so multipolar today. I think we're sort of headed there 2025, 2030 is really when that's going to emerge. But when I look at 2023, I actually see a unipolar hangover, for lack of a better word. I mean, China is reeling from the COVID stuff and is going to be for the first couple months of the year as COVID works its way through the system. Russia, I mean, it's a failed state. It's a gas station. It's a I don't know exactly what. The Europeans are squabbling with each other. It seems to me that you know, the U.S. is kind of calling the shots right now. Biden doesn't have elections for another two years, so maybe he has some freedom. So I've sort of been working from the perspective of multipolar trend is intact and all these different countries like Brazil, like Turkey are moving away from the United States. But in 2023, like the U.S. is still kind of the top dog from a geopolitical power perspective. So I wanted to close by asking in 2023, if we're thinking about U.S. versus international, either equity performance or bond performance or whatever metric you want to use, do you think that 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 the geopolitics will get reflected in markets, i.e. that 2023 should be a year of U.S. outperformance just because everybody else is doing worse relative? Or do you think the market will look past that and will say, hey, like the multipolar world is coming. The U.S. isn't going to be able to do this forever. We're going to start allocating either to gold or to Indian you know, utilities or, or wherever else people want to find opportunities. Oof, very difficult to answer long-term questions like end of 2023 is a whopping 11 and a half months away so a lot <laughs> can happen between now and then um i'm gonna tell you how i look at things today so the macro compass portfolios are skewed to be um long china when it comes to risk rather than the us at the moment that's a cyclical play on the reopening though it's working very well since the beginning of the year probably will work for a bit longer but Really, equity performance, Jacob, is the result of multiples and earnings. And during a recession over the last 50 years, the SMB lows, ultimate lows, when a recession hit, were 11 to 12 months after the recession started, not before. And the recession in the US hasn't started yet because the recession is the combination of earnings contraction and the labor market softness. Mm -hmm. And maybe we get one. My models are saying April 2023 might be the base case for when we start to have a recession. That means that if history repeats again, the lows of the SMB 500 are to be hit in the 12 months after April 2023. And that simply happens because earnings start to underperform on the downside. So analysts have to expect a much lower earnings path. And the Federal Reserve cannot start easing straight away this time even further because inflation is still too high. So the multiple expansion that comes as a result of Fed easing and you know better risk sentiment will take maybe a bit longer to unfold. So you have that double negative whammy, basically, that should bring equity prices to the 33, 34,000 area for S&P 500. When you look at other places outside the US, uh, the earnings recession is probably going to be bad as well. If it's, if it's a global earnings recession coming from, coming from you know, the money printer stopping when it comes to fiscal deficits, when it comes to liquidity pr um, uh, providing by central banks, that's valid as well for Europe, that's valid as well for other uh, countries. Um, to be honest, it's hard to call a year-end U.S. versus the rest of the world in terms of preference. I think that uh, leaning defensive when it comes to not being overly excited about bear market rallies, it's the same theme of 2022, I think still keeps very valid for 2023. I'm hearing already, it's the 10th of, of, of January, and I'm hearing already that I'm totally wrong and the S&P will rally to 5,000 and this is the start of a bull market. I've heard this story already five or six times last year. I think I'm going to hear it for uh, a few more times uh, this year, and I'd rather uh, lean defensive and wait for the earnings recession to unfold before becoming more constructive. Hmm. Fair point, Elf. Um, Jacob, you and I, have, we've talked about the positive outlook for LATAM quite a few times over the past mm -hmm. couple of quarters. Uh, I am now getting less constructive on Latin America as a consequence of what we see. Uh, I find Latin America to be on the receiving end of a lot of the positive flows should we enter a multipolar world. So if you're right that we get sort of a standstill in that trend in 23, I think it will be a negative for Brazil and Mexico, for example. Um, secondly, if we get lower inflation in the US um, quite rapidly over the course of the spring, which I find likely, then the US dollar is a sell relative to other Western currencies but it is a buy relative to LATAM currencies on historical correlations. Uh, and I think the reason is that a slowdown in inflation in the US means a slowdown in inflation in Brazil and Mexico as well. Mm -hmm. And we know 
from 2022 that um, the Brazilian and Mexican central banks they are very good at fighting inflation relative to Western central banks. So I get if we I guess if we get this this inflation trend throughout this year, it will not be as critical to be a good inflation fighter as it was in 2022. So I'm leaning negative on LATAM for the first time in quite a while, as a consequence of that. Um, and on the question of whether the US will outperform Europe, uh, I'm leaning positive Europe. And if I were to look for so-called carry cases, um, so cases with a positive interest rate spread relative to where I live, I would probably look towards countries like Hungary, Poland, and Czech Republic, um, rather than Latin America uh, right now. Uh, so. I'll leave it at that. Uh, as you can hear, I'm born and raised in foreign exchange, so I talk a lot about interest rates in foreign exchange markets. Uh, and that's also why I know a lot about energy, because I used to cover the Norwegian krona. And if you call mm. Russia a gas field, I don't know how to classify Norway. It's just a small gas field, then, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say that uh, I think Hungary, sh shit's going to get real in that forex market yeah. this year. Um, tell, the, tell the listeners where we can find you guys before I let you go. Uh, you can find my work, this is Alf speaking, at the Macro Compass. Uh, it's my research firm, de delivers as well macro ETF portfolios, trade ideas, interactive tools, courses. It's a whole macro platform. Macrocompass.com You can find me, Andreas Steno, at stenoresearch.com. And otherwise, let me highlight the energy cable at Substack. Uh, if you're interested in energy markets, um, in relation to geopolitics, that's your publication. All right, sounds good. And hope, hopefully we'll find you back here in a couple months' time and we can look at Why how not? wrong we all were. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jacob, for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.